Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio. Do you have a love for the truth? Well, the truth is, the Bible warns us that the Antichrist will come in the last days and desecrate a newly built temple in Jerusalem. Did you know that prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled as the preparation of the third temple in Jerusalem is now underway and in the planning stages? Even the priests are currently in training, and the detailedly ornate and holy ritual instruments are being constructed. Rabbis are even predicting the imminent arrival of the Messiah, which ancient prophecy tells us will be instead the Antichrist. Well, our guest today, Bob Mitchell, author of the best-selling book, The Temple of the Antichrist, is here to discuss the details of the Third Temple's progress. Bob Mitchell is the founder of Shofar Ministries. His zillions of prophecy videos can be found on the YouTube, so check them out. Bob Mitchell was born in the UK. He has been a Christian for over 50 years. He is an author of several books on Bible prophecy, including Rome, Babylon, the Great, and Europe as well as Antichrist, the Vatican, and the Great Deception. Bob has spoken on prophetic subjects in conferences and churches around the UK and also in the USA. For several years, Bob and his wife Maria hosted the Prophecy Update program on a UK based Christian TV satellite channel that was seen across Europe and Africa. Bob is currently producing his weekly Prophecy Update programs on YouTube, so check him out. Bob Mitchell of Shofar Ministries. Bob Mitchell, it's a pleasure to have you back with us on Love for the Truth Radio. Thank you, Cindy. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. Oh, you know, Bob, I really enjoy your videos on the YouTube channel. Um, very often I, I refer to them or I get to see them and listen to them. And the research that you do is on believable, especially about the end times. And that's where I want to start, Bob. You know, what does the Bible have to say about the signs of the end times that would point to the Lord's soon return? Oh, Cindy, there are, there are several signs, signposts, if you will, that, that mm-hmm. actually point to a specific period in history that the Bible calls the end times or the last days. Now, I believe the last days began when Jesus ascended, and since then, we've been waiting for his return. You know, the the writer in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So the writer to the Hebrews believed he was living in the last days. Mm. Having said all that, I believe, in fact, I'm, I'm certain he knew there had to be specific events or signs take place before the Lord returned in power to reign. The power or influence of evil and a prevalent anti-God mm. of Bible influence would have to rise globally before Jesus returned. Now, I, a little ad, I wrote a, a little book called Signs of the End, and I listed the 10 signs out of the many the Bible gives that would show us we are entering or indeed in the last of the last days and the end of the end times. Jesus said the last days would mirror the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Mm. Well, in Noah's day, the Bible says the earth was filled with violence. Well, today the earth, no one would, today on this earth, no one would disagree. Is It's a very violent place. We live in a world that's constantly increasing in violence. It's got new ways to commit mm. crime. It's on the increase constantly. Now, some may argue, of course, the world has always been a violent planet, and that's true. But we have to consider this one of the signs alongside the others Jesus and the prophets gave us. You see, in Noah's day and in Abraham's day and in the days of the prophets, true believers were in the minority. Only Noah, for instance, and his immediate family were saved when God's judgment, the global flood, covered the earth. Believers were indeed in the minority. Yes. And 
true Bible believers are today in the minority in today's world, where any and every belief system is looked upon as valid, apart from the belief that God sent his son to earth to die in our place for our sins. That's the minority view, where once it was the belief that took the Roman world by storm, yes. changed the face of the planet, militarily, socially, politically, so on. Our laws were based on the Ten Commandments, but now we see the plaques with the Ten Commandments being removed from outside mm. and inside government institutions. We are now like Noah in the minority. And in Noah's day, there was an unbelief in prophecy. There's no fear of God. Noah preached for 120 years as he built the ark. And yet, in the end, it was only him and his family who were yes. saved. No one believed his warnings of coming judgment. There was unbelief in prophecy for telling what was to come. And it is just the same today. You try telling people outside what, what the world is like and how prophecy actually describes today's day. Is today's day like Noah's day? You better believe yes, it. Yes. Violent society. The world has changed to the point where it actually mirrors the days of Noah. Mm. There's a growing hatred of those who disagree. Try telling people about Bible prophecy and you'll see you're in the minority. There is an unbelief in end times Bible prophecy, even in many churches that profess to follow Jesus. To many, today life is going on as normal unless you have eyes to see what's going on behind the scene. And today there are spiritual forces that, that yes. as we speak, are moving us toward uh, a possible Middle East or Third World War, mm -hmm. the appearance of the man the Bible calls the man of sin, the Antichrist. And Jesus said, as it was in Noah's time, history is going to repeat itself, be a definite sign of his near return. And then you have... The prophecy of Daniel, where in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, the angel said to Daniel to seal up the words of the book, seal it until the time of the end when many will run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. So yes. you've got another sign. Yes. Many are going to run to and fro. Travel and knowledge will increase. Mm. But do these words fit our time as opposed to any other in time in history? Yes, they do. Do you know... Cindy, in less than over a hundred years, the world we live in has moved from the travel by horse to the railroad, to yes. the car, mm. to the plane, to the spaceship. That's an explosion in travel yes, that's is. unprecedented mm -hmm. in human history. You know, up to a little over a hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, the most common way of travel was by horse or buggy. Since then, there's been an explosion in the area of travel. Mm. And years ago, my grandparents, they, they barely moved outside of their own town, let alone to another country. Yes, yes. It took the Pilgrim Fathers three months to sail to America. Now, today I can go to London, I can have breakfast in London and dinner in New York, and no one thinks anything of it. That's right. So yeah. do the words of the angel to Daniel regarding the last days fit our time? Yes, indeed they do, unlike any period in history that's gone before. But the angel also told Daniel that in the time of the end, knowledge will also increase. Yes. Has that happened in our time? Definitely, Cindy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know, Cindy, in, in 1900, knowledge was said to have doubled every 100 years. Wow. By 1945, it was doubling every 25 years. Amazing. Today, they tell us knowledge doubles every 13 months. Now, I don't know how this works, but I'm being told that in the near future, your knowledge is going to be able to be doubled every 12 hours. There's wow. been a knowledge explosion. Wow. In the 100 years you know today you can do things that just a few years ago that would have been looked upon as science fiction or magic yes, yes. now in, in the book there are there are other signs i give like the days of lot and the global acceptance of homosexuality the rebirth of israel which we're going to look at the recapture of jerusalem plans to build the temple the revived roman empire the ability to monitor all of mankind john predicted that two thousand years ago wow there would come a system where you could monitor everybody on the planet. How did he know that? Yes. 2,000 years ago. Yes. And there's going to be a one world religion or global spirituality mm. the Bible speaks about, which is anti the God of the Bible. Now, we can't cover all those signs today. Yes. 
they were predicted thousands of years yes. ago simply, to come to fruition in just one generation which i hope to show later is now when we're around now when you see all these signs on either on your horizon or actually coming to pass like we can now you can be sure you're in a part of that final generation that's going to see jesus return in power from heaven to rule from jerusalem wow Boy, I'll tell you, you really set the stage. It's true. I never really thought of all of that in one lump sum. You know, travel has changed, knowledge has changed, just evil has been increasing, violence is increasing, prophecies are being un uh, fulfilled, there's unnatural affections that we're getting to see. All of this is pointing to the signs of the end times. Bobby, yeah. you just said that so brilliant brilliantly. Uh, you know, one of the signs, however, that you mentioned that I really want to talk about this, and that is that Israel becoming a nation was one of the prevalent signs uh, that had taken place. Uh, when did this take place? And, and Bob, let's can we briefly talk about this? Oh, Cindy, briefly? That's one of my favorite <laughs> subjects. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's, it's I take your time. You can take as long as you <laughs> want. <laughs> it's a major, yeah. if not the major sign of the 20th century. Mm. And it was in May the 14th, 1948. You know, at that time, I mean, I was just, I wasn't even two years old. We witnessed a people scattered around the globe for almost 2,000 years. They returned to the exact same land from which they were ejected. Yes. That's unprecedented yes, in world history. No people have ever lost their homeland and all the infrastructure that goes to make up a visible working nation completely eradicated from the map. The people scattered, yet keeping their identity. You see American Jews. German Jews, mm. French Jews, wherever they were scattered, they stayed Jews. They never completely assimilated into the nations they went into. When I was in Jerusalem, I even saw, would you believe, a Chinese Jew. Wow. On oh, the my goodness. Of me. And after 2,000 years yeah. to return to the very place from which they were ousted, Cindy, it's totally unheard of. Yes. But you know what? There, there's something very interesting. It's, it's even mystical, if you like, about this date, 1948. Many Bible scholars show us that there is a repeated number throughout Scripture. It's the number seven. I call it God's favorite number. Mm. Dr. Ivan Panin was a Russian agnostic last century, and he did a study on the Hebrew Bible. Now, every Hebrew letter and every Greek letter has a number. Yes. That's not numerology. You see, you and I, when we write a number down, we write it in Roman numerals. But the Greeks and the Hebrews, they would write a letter for a number. Yes. Well, Panin discovered that throughout the entire Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, he found multiples of the number seven. Whole verses like Genesis 1-1 is a matrix of multiples of seven. Hmm. Well. So I wondered, when I was, got into all of this, I wondered, well, how far does this go? And in the end, I wrote another little book called God's Amazing Word. And in that book, among other things that I, I found out, I took a look at the first Zionist conference when the Jews met with the avowed intent of finding a Jewish homeland for themselves. Mm. Now, I've found some incredible patterns emerging from this, and it proves there is an unseen hand, Cindy, mm. the hand of God involved in the Jewish history, and they're looking for a homeland, coming into the homeland. This conference took place in, I don't know, I I pronounce it Basel, some say, some call it Baal, B-A-S-L-E, in Switzerland. I'll say Basel, Basel in Switzerland, August the 29th, 1897. They were looking for a homeland, right? Fifty years later, the newly formed United Nations voted in favor of the creation of the State of Israel. That date was November the 29th, 1947. Well, we'll be right back with Bob Mitchell, so please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener... 
You'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views from a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please, take everything you hear on this radio program to study and prayer. And thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome back. We are with Bob Mitchell, author of the best-selling book, The Temple of the Antichrist. And in this segment, we will cover the signs of the end times that point to the Antichrist and the Lord's return. But Bob, I want you to finish up with you where you left off on the last segment. Right, Cindy. I'll just go back a little bit. Well, this There was a conference to search for a land for the Jewish people. Mm. That was held in 1897 on the 29th of August. They were looking for a homeland. Now, I found some amazing facts concerning this because we go August the 29th, 1897. 50 years later, the newly formed United Nations voted in favor for the creation of the State of Israel. Mm. That was November the 29th, 1947. So let's do some simple maths. And we're talking about God's favorite number, the number seven. From the first Zionist conference, August the 29th, 1897, to the United Nations vote for the birth of Israel, 29th of November, 1947, there are 18,354 days or 2,622 days times seven. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. It's crazy. So what we discover, if we look at the number of days from the UN vote on November the 29th, 1947, to the actual establishment of the State of Israel on May the 14th, 1948. Well, there are 168 days or 24 days times seven exactly. Wow. If you calculate the number of days from that first Zionist conference, 29th of August, 1897, to Israel's recapture of Jerusalem on the 10th of June, 1967, in the Six-Day War, we discover there are 25,487 days, which amazingly is 3,641 days times seven exactly. Now, is that God's hand? That's or is unbelievable. That yes. yes. Now, here's the cruncher, Cindy. Now, I'm getting really excited now. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the Psalms are prophetic, like Psalm 22, where it speaks about the crucifixion before crucifixion was ever invented. The, the, the psalmist talks about his hands and his feet being pierced. Mm. And that had, that had never happened. That was completely prophetic. But I also believe Psalm 102 is a psalm looking down through time to the Holocaust and the eventual rebirth of Israel following the Second World War, written more than two and a half thousand years ago. I want you and the listeners to imagine you're in a death camp. Mm. Some of the words are exactly what one might be saying if you were in Auschwitz, Treblinka, or Dachau. The psalm, I'm only going to read a part of it, but just imagine this, when you're in a death camp, with, with the, the bodies being burnt, it's, it's a horrible mm. thing, being starved to death. Psalm 102, and there, there's a real cruncher in this psalm that just blew me away when I found out. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poured out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burnt like an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch, and I'm like a sparrow alone upon the housetop. My enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me. Because I have eaten ashes like bread, I've mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down, my days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. 
thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. God has a set time yes. mm -hmm. when he's going to have mercy upon Zion. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, Israel, mm. he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people that shall be created shall praise the Lord. Okay, now, let's stop there. Now, this, Cindy, so excites me. Yes. You're reading here of the cries of the afflicted in Auschwitz and the Nazi death camps. Then we see God has mercy. His appointed time has come to have mercy on Israel. Israel is reborn. Zion rises again. Now in Psalm 102 verse 18, it says, this is written for the generation to come. Mm. That is a bad translation from the Hebrew text. The Hebrew here is dor acharon, dor acharon. That doesn't mean a generation to come. The Hebrew reads, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he'll appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for dor acharon. Now, Cindy, you ready for this? Yes, <laughs> In please. English, it will read, When the Lord rebuilds Zion, he will appear in his glory. Wow. He will regard the prayer of the destitute. This shall be written for the last generation. Wow. The generation mm. that saw the Jewish state reborn when the Lord built up Zion, Israel, that, I believe, began the final generation. Most would say a generation is around 70 years, maybe. But when God's set time came, mm. Israel was reborn. The clock for the final generation, according to Psalm 102, began to count down the days until the Messiah returns in glory. It says, when the Lord rebuilds Zion, that is written for the last generation. Wow. That's when he appears in his glory. Mm. That is a mind blower. It is a mind blower because we're we are the last generation, right? This is it. I believe so, you see, if if you say 1948 was the start of the final generation, yes. but somewhere maybe within the next 29 years it could all come together and Christ could return. Now, a little codicil that doesn't, of course, mean I'm right. Some right. other students of prophecy class a generation as 70, yeah. 100, or gotcha. even 120 years. Yes, yeah, so could be, yeah. Their 70-years anniversary is next year. So we're actually living in the 70th year now, hmm. completed 69 years last May. But we're in the last 100 years. Mm. We're in the 100 years, uh, if you know what I mean. Yes. So things could kick off in the next few months, start of start the final stage of history before the end all we can do is watch and pray i i believe i'm no prophet by any means i believe we are somewhere within that final generation that the lord says when he would rebuild zion he will appear in his glory and that's written for the last the final generation mm, isn't that amazing wow and you know we know that the jews return to their their land uh I mean, it's it's the prophecy has been fulfilled. We know that, and especially you know when I think too, Bob, that the Iron Curtain was rent, and then the the Jews from uh, Russia were able to come back to their own country, which I think blew my mind years ago. But you know, the yeah. Bible does speak about now. I, I want to get on on the building of the third temple because the reason okay. for them returning and building the third temple. Why don't you explain that? The reason, well, there's a growing number among yeah. secular Jews in Israel and around the mm -hmm. world to rebuild the temple. The last temple, of course, was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Yes. Since then, the dream has been to see a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. And once Jerusalem was recaptured in 1967, that, during, that, that dream increased. See, the temple is the center of Jewish religious life, or it was until it was destroyed. Without the temple, there can be no sacrificial system mm. for the forgiveness of sins. They need that temple for the old sacrificial system to be restored. Interestingly, you and I and other believers yes. know Jesus, Yeshua, was the final sacrifice for sins, for sins, the Lamb of God who took away our sins on the cross. And it's by believing in him as our final sacrifice, as our sin offering, 
and turning from our sins and following him, we have peace with God. There's no need for any further sacrifices. But, of course, the Jewish people, Cindy, in the main, don't see it that way. Yes. And this is the whole point of the problem today with the Temple Mount. Who owns it? Yes, and that's what's, that's my next question is like, what is currently going on with Israel right now in reference to the Temple Mount and the stage ultimately being set? Well, the current uprising that we, we saw just mm -hmm. recently has more to do with who owns the Temple Mount yes. than the setting up and then the removal of the security uh, barriers and the cameras. See, the Palestinians now feel they've won a great victory they see Israel as weak. Now they've removed the security systems and the security cameras. They've even got cartoons now showing old Palestinian men and women and children kicking the security guards as they take the barriers down. Mm. I think this can only lead to more violence. Yes. You see, the Muslims will tell you there never was a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, so why have one now? Right. But, aha, I have a booklet that shows the 1920s it's written by the muslim mark the people the muslims who run the temple mount mm. it's written by muslims in the 1920s and the muslims at that time in charge of the temple mount they write in the booklet for tourists that this was the place of solomon's temple wow. now today mm. it's good politics to deny the jews the right to the temple mount but god says it was re it will be rebuilt 2 Thessalonians says the Antichrist will enter the temple and desecrate it. So the, the Muslims in the 1920s believed the Temple Mount was the place of the temple, mm. but not today. Interesting. And as you're going to see later on, there are plans in place even now for the rebuilding of the temple. Mm. And that's very exciting. These are incredible unprecedented days to be alive in yes it is and you know what surprises me bob is we don't hear this in in our churches we don't like this to me is the news this should be in the news you know and we're not Absolutely. we're not hearing the prophecies i mean in fact we have people you know uh renowned uh men that claim to be Christians that are saying, oh, we don't need to listen to prophecy. You know, we shouldn't uh, look into that, you know. And I, what, what's going on with that, Bob? I know that we didn't talk about it, but I know that you faced some of those problems as well, where prophecy is not something that the church wants to talk about right now. Well, then we might just as well cut out a third of the Bible there because around a third mm -hmm. of the Bible is prophetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to talk about prophecy, then yes. throw it. You might as well throw half or a third of the Bible away. I think it was um, somebody, one of, one of these guys, I won't mention his name, he said that when Jesus was about to ascend and the disciples came to him and said to him, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom? Yes. Jesus said, well, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that God has under his control. And this, this gentleman, he said that what this man was saying was what what jesus was saying was leave prophecy out you don't need to listen to prophecy but that's wrong yes it is we'll be back with bob mitchell author of the best-selling book the temple of the antichrist many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times grave immorality is on the rise as in the days of noah and sodom and gomorrah there are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you 
for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. Our guest, Bob Mitchell, is the author of the best-selling book, The Temple of the Antichrist. He's here to discuss the details of the Third Temple, its progress, and we will be talking about that. But I wanted to mention that Bob is a great author of many other books, and to mention a few is God's Amazing Word is one of his books, along with Signs of the End. He also has written Rome, Babylon, the Great, and Europe. So uh, check him out. Go on to Amazon, look up Bob Mitchell, and you'll find his books there. You know, Bob, why don't we finish up what you what you were saying before uh, the break so that we can, you know, come to some kind of conclusion? Yeah, sure. You, I mean, you, you were saying that some people in the churches today don't even want to know about prophecy and that mm-hmm. there is a very famous preacher who, uh, who is around today, and he he takes the the verses where the 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 disciples are talking to Jesus just before he ascends and they're saying are you going to restore the kingdom and Jesus said it's not for you to know the times and the seasons Mm -hmm. and this preacher is saying what Jesus is saying is do away with prophecy you don't need prophecy at all well like we said if you're going to do away with prophecy you do away with a third of the Bible what Jesus was actually saying was Mm -hmm. at this moment in time you don't need to know that Yes. Now, there are certain periods, epochs in time and prophecy when things are going to take place. And at this present time, I'm ascending to heaven. You don't really need to know the times and the seasons. When they come, you'll know about That's them. Right. But, That's right. That's right. But study them by all means. Yes. By and- all means. And we're in those seasons right now, folks, and that's what Bob uh, Mitchell is talking about. He's giving us the signs of the time, so it's time to look and to watch what is going on in the Middle East. Why don't we talk about that, Bob? Well, in the Middle East, well, at, them, it's, at this moment, Cindy, there mm-hmm. is an undercurrent, you know, following what's been going on recently out in Israel, there's an undercurrent that could mean a war of some kind or an uprising of some kind in the days ahead. A lot of people don't know, but with the current situation in Syria, Russia has recently moved some of their troops to Israel's northern Golan Heights border. Mm. The Palestinians are now wanting an uprising of some kind. That's following the recent shooting of a terrorist in Jordan by an Israeli security guard at the Israeli embassy in Amman. The Jordanians are now calling for some kind of action. And I believe it is this coming Monday, the king of Jordan is going to visit Abbas, the Palestinian leader, for a few hours. Now, this is interesting because he hasn't visited Abbas for about five years. Mm. And to suddenly make a trip, a private trip that is just going to take a few hours is, to me, that sounds ominous. Yes. So I think some kind of undercurrent is, is... on the move, an uprising, a war or something, I don't know, but I think we should keep our eyes very much on the Middle East in the days ahead, in Israel particularly, mm-hmm. and Jerusalem. Yes, yeah, and, and, and getting back to Jerusalem, we spoke about in the first segment how the Jews have come back to their country, and the purpose, one of the main purposes, is so they can build their temple, and they can have, once again, their sacrificial system. You know, Bob, I heard... Uh, I heard you said that there were plans right now being drawn for the third temple. Um, oh, yeah. You know, like we we hear, like where is that going to be? And you got the mosque sitting there, and you know they have to move the mosque. So what's going on? But at, at, right now, currently, they're still making plans for the third temple, even though that has not been determined yet as far as where it's going to be. What are the particulars? Well, there's an increasing number of Jewish people inside and outside mm-hmm. Israel who want the temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount mm-hmm. and the sacrifices reinstated. Now, architectural plans have already been made for the temple. They're online. If you go on to YouTube, mm-hmm. to the Temple Institute, you'll find that they've actually got a, a, a video uh, which shows the plans. And there's a graphic showing how the temple will look when it's built. Everything they say is ready. Wow. All they really need is the go-ahead. And even the Jewish religious body that condemned Jesus, the Sanhedrin, has been re-established after an absence wow. of over 1,500 years. Now, I, I said earlier, the Bible says the temple will be built, the Antichrist will enter it and desecrate it. He's going to call himself God or a God, and he's going to demand worship. Now, there are 
talks going on now between the Sanhedrin, mm. other rabbis, and the former head of the Temple Institute, who's Rabbi Yehuda Glick. He's, he used to be the head of the body that made the temple instruments that uh, would go into the temple. Yehuda Glick and these other guys are now in discussion with leading Muslims, especially in Turkey, with regard to the coming Messiah and wow. the building of the temple. Incidentally, Rabbi Glick is no longer the head of the Temple Institute because Mr. Netanyahu has seen to it that he's been elected to Israel's parliament. And that says volumes. Wow. Well, the Muslims are now talking, uh, the Muslims they're talking to want a temple for all people. An ecumenical sort of one size fits all. Yes. It doesn't matter or not what you believe. You come and worship your God here. Now, mm. when I was in Israel, I actually saw Rabbi Yehuda Glick at the Temple Institute, and he told us that is what they want to see built on the Temple Mount beside the Dome of the Rock. There's an empty space to the north of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, and they believe the temple could be built there. And he said, it will be a place of worship for all wow. people. Wow, wow. Isn't that this interesting? Is, that's, that's totally against the word of God and the Bible. Yes. And the Sanhedrin, in a televised interview with the Muslims mm -hmm. in Turkey, they gave the hint that the coming Islamic Messiah, the Mahdi, they said, well, he sounds very much like their idea of the Jewish Messiah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. It's amazing days. Oh. Ama so, amazing, amazing days. And you know what's so interesting is, is that, okay, so you've got the mosque, and of course that re represents the Muslims, so now they can't use that. But if they build the building next to it, then it's for all people. That's very, very interesting. Now, I, I heard you say, Bob, that the priests are being trained. Now, this is, it's, it's almost weird to say, okay, we're going to go by the model that's in the Bible, and yet it's going to be for all different people. So there's something really major going on here. But let's yeah. talk about the priests that are being trained. How are they choosing these priests? Well, they're, they're actually in training now as we speak. Mm. That to be a priest, one has to be from the priestly line. And up until modern times, no Jew really could prove he's of the priestly family, going back to Aaron, the first high priest, Moses' brother. Yes. But now, through modern genetics, mm. incredibly, that priestly line can be traced by DNA. That's crazy. So all a Jew who wishes to be a priest has to do is to get his DNA tested to see if he is of that line. Oh. You see, there is a certain genetic marker within the DNA that is found in the descendants of the priests, and it is found significantly wow. far less in other Jewish males. And again, in these last days, what is being discovered uh, is so amazing. It those is amazing. Very descendants, oh. Those very descendants of the ancient priests are now today, will we speak, oh my goodness. in training for their temple duties. And did you know, last year, 2016, the high priest was elected in anticipation of a coming temple. He was the first high priest wow. of Israel in 2,000 years. Oh, my what goodness. What that is to be alive. Oh, it is amazing to be alive. And, you know, the, the, uh, be alive. This is really what the news should be, especially in our church culture right now. I did not know that, that the high priest was chosen in 2016. Cindy, I, I preach about this in some churches, and they just look at me, as if I've, <laughs> I can't even imagine what they were thinking of. Well, we're not no. of this world anyway. We're just in it, Bob, so that's okay. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> what amazes me is folks in, in some churches will come up to you afterwards and all they'll say is thank you for that and they'll walk out the door. Oh, my God. Now, if that was me and I was hearing this kind of stuff, I'd say, <laughs> Wow, how, how is this happening? Can we have a coffee somewhere? Yes. Come and tell me about this. Exactly. Well, you know what? I think what's so neat is like, again, here's the whole thing, the genetics that they scientifically now can, can see if someone's from the Levite lineage. You know, yeah. that is amazing. Who would have known that? to know who would even be priests today. And just with our, our technology, it's just amazing as to what is going on. And I also heard, Bob, that they are already, uh, you know, making the instruments. God was very specific in the Old Testament about the way the furniture was to be constructed. Now, is there actually a company making the furniture for the temple? You know, or is this going on? What's going on with that? Yeah, the, the Temple Institute mm -hmm. in Jerusalem mm -hmm. has made 
more than 70% of all the instruments needed to go into the temple. When I went to Israel, you can go down into the old city of Jerusalem and visit the Temple Institute. They will gladly show you around. And in these cases, they have the the high priest's garments, the ordinary priest's garments. They they have the silver trumpets. They have everything. They have the... um, they have the 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 uh, altar of incense that is made of wood but covered in pure gold. Yes. Oh. They they have the uh, temp- the table of shewbread again made of wood covered mm-hmm. in pure gold. Mm-hmm. They have the the golden menorah which itself is just made of pure gold. Oh. That's it's outside of the temple institute facing the temple mount and you can see all of this and more when you when you go there. It's yeah. ready. It's just sitting there. Just standing. And, uh, and they are still and and the the priests, would you believe, are even being measured up for their outfits oh my to go. Goodness. They're even practicing the sacrifices. They have to learn how to conduct the sacrifices so that when the temple is rebuilt, when they get the go ahead, they just go straight up there onto the temple mount. And they're ready to go. They're, they're ready. ready to. Oh, wow, really that's go. so interesting. And you know, you when you read in the Bible, you know, it's very specific instructions of, as to how this furniture, these implements or instruments had to be constructed. So yeah. this is amazing. What amazes me is you have all of the methods and the, and the rituals and the ordinances of, of the, what the Bible says, but then they go ahead and say, well, this will be for all people. So uh, yeah. that's, that's just amazing. Wow. So, you know, I know that this, I don't want to throw you off here, but there, I I heard that there was a, a red heifer. I remember years ago they were trying to find a red heifer or trying yeah. to raise a red heifer that was out without spot or blemish that is actually required uh, yeah. for the sacrificial system. What, what do you know about that? Well, the ashes of the red heifer were used for to be for a purification ceremony from sin. But to date, as I understand, no pure red heifers have been born in Israel. Mm-hmm. Now there is a teaching that it is the Messiah who will sacrifice the red heifer when he comes. So maybe when the false Messiah comes, the Antichrist, the red heifer will also be around then. Mm -hmm. Though some say the red heifer will not even be needed when Messiah is here. So it's it's a a will-they-won't-they situation at the moment. Some Jews say you need the red heifer. Others say, well, you know, when I'm, I'm even waving my hands like I'm Jewish. Um, <laughs> well, you know, when the Messiah comes, he'll sort that out, and there, there will be a red heifer that will come along when the Messiah comes, and we'll sort it out when it comes. So they're not overly bothered. What their main concern is is getting ready to move in and have all the instruments and everything else ready. So their their, their plan is to have the red heifer ready when the messiah comes and we know the messiah that is coming first of all will be the antichrist we're going on a break we'll be right back so please stay tuned for the conclusion you're listening to love for the truth radio we'll be right back so please stay tuned In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. We're in our last segment of this very informative program. Our guest, Bob Mitchell, is the author of the best-selling book, The Temple of the Antichrist. Uh, He will clue us in on the characteristics and the details of the Antichrist, uh, which I think is very amazing, Bob. You know, what what clues did the ancient prophets say about the Antichrist's place of origin? This is something that I've never studied or heard of before. Well, Cindy, many of the church fathers, uh, those who followed the apostles, um, they studied the prophets 
and men right up to the present day after studying the prophets have come to the conclusion the antichrist will indeed be jewish as many people mm. say but uh, see in daniel 11 37 it says neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all but in his estate he will honour the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honour with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. So the term there, the God of his fathers, that is a distinctly Jewish term. And I did a search and I found it all through the Old Testament. So-and-so went back to the God of his fathers. So-and-so did not follow the God of his fathers, etc. You find it all through yes. the Old Testament. If you just do a search, God of his fathers, it just pops up from everywhere. Mm. But he will gain the acceptance of his fellow Jews by pure deception. See, many believe he will, according to the prophecy of Daniel at the very least, have his roots in the area of ancient Assyria, north of Israel. That is in the area of Turkey, Syria and Iran, mm. or Iraq rather. Turkey, Syria and Iraq. Now, if you go back to the church fathers, who were very interesting, Hippolytus of Rome, he lived from 170 to 235 AD, and he was a pupil of Irenaeus, who himself was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, the disciple of Jesus. Mm. Now, in Hippolytus's work, which was called the Treatise on Christ and Antichrist, he wrote this, he said, Isaiah speaks thus, in Isaiah 10, 12, wherefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of, of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. And he closes his writing by saying, the Assyrian mm. is another name for the Antichrist. Yes. He believed the Antichrist would come from Assyria and would be a Jew and claim the title of Messiah. And Victorinus of Pataus of Slovenia was probably born in Greece and he, he died around 304 AD. He was martyred during the persecution of the Emperor Diocletian. He wrote a book on the uh, on the apocalypse and he quoted Micah 5.5 5, where, where Micah 5.5 5 says, this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces then we shall raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And he says the Assyrian mentioned in Micah 5.5 5 is in fact the Antichrist. Yes. Now, Lactantius of Rome, he lived between 250 to 320 AD. And he wrote a book called The Divine Institutes. And he said a king shall, arrive out, uh, shall arise out of Assyria, oh. born from an evil spirit. He'll be the overthrower and destroyer of the human race. He will be a prophet of lies. He will constitute and call himself God and will order himself to be worshipped as the son of God. Now, coming more up to date, Clarence Larkin, who wrote Dispensational Truth, he said, it is clear the Antichrist is to come from Syria or Assyria. We are to understand, therefore, that the king of the north is the king of Assyria. This fixes the locality of where the Antichrist will come from. And A.W. Pink, who my wife Maria is reading at the moment, he wrote the book The Antichrist, which is a fantastic book. Mm. He said, we have seen the scriptures which help us to determine... Sorry about that. We have seen the scriptures which help us to determine the direction from where he will arise and speak of him as a little horn. Now, the first thing this title denotes is that he is the king. He is the king of Assyria. Mm. Now, while all this doesn't prove beyond doubt the Antichrist will come or have his roots in the old Assyrian Empire north of Israel, it does show the idea of a totally European Antichrist is fairly recent. So you could be looking for a Jewish man with Assyrian roots who will arise like lightning among ten regions or rulers in the coming days and form some kind of alliance with Israel concerning Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Now, if you put all this together with the plans to build a temple yes, and the incredible talks going on now between the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Glick, 
and prominent Muslims in Turkey. <gasps> but what I'm going to share now actually blew my mind. Daniel says he will honor the God of forces. Now, yes. this is interesting because it says he doesn't regard any God. He doesn't regard the God of his fathers, but he does regard or honor the God of forces. Yes. Now, is that a contradiction? Well, no, it may actually be a revelation. Yes. The Hebrew word in Daniel, where it says forces, is mauzim, mauzim. Mm. Some commentators suggest this is related to a god of military might. Now, I actually was shaken when I studied this Hebrew word mm. because I looked it up on the internet. And as I did, I noticed there's a Turkish word, mauzim, which is almost identical. Mm. And that is the word for the man who calls the people to pray to Allah. Wow. So do you see now the Hebrew mazim, mazim is plural. I, any Hebrew word with I am on the end is a plural word. So the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word mazim has been translated forces. You see how mm, yes. I've said to the Hebrew to the Turkish word muzin, the single singular word for the one who calls people to pray to Allah. So, Cindy, could yes. it be mm. the Jewish Antichrist from the Assyrian area will not regard the God of his Jewish fathers, yes. but will instead honor the God of the muzin, mm. the men? call people to pray to Allah, the God of Islam. And at the moment, we have the Jewish Sanhedrin, we have Rabbi Glick and others in Turkey speaking to Muslims. Oh, wow. Wow, what a connection, Bob. That just, I have, I have chills up and down my now, arms here. Wow. Now, I, I have to tell you, I can't recommend yes. highly enough a really fantastic book. Nathaniel West mm -hmm. wrote a book called Daniel's Break. Daniel's great prophecy, the Eastern question, the kingdom. Now, he was a man way ahead of his time yes. because he wrote this book yes. in 1898. And he wrote about the Antichrist. He wrote about the rise of Islam and the last days. And when he wrote about this translation of Daniel 1137, he said he called it Allah Muzim, the God of fortresses. And he says he is honoring Allah with gold and silver and precious stones, a god unknown to his ancestors. Wow. Nathaniel West beat me by 119 wow. years. Wow. So I, I recommend that book, Nathaniel West, yes. Daniel's Great Prophecy, The Eastern Question, The Kingdom, written in 1898. You can get it now on Amazon. I was going to ask you that, yeah. Okay, so that's Nathaniel West, and yeah. that's... Uh, in Daniel's, Daniel's, Daniel's Great yeah. Prophecy. Great Daniel's Great Prophecy, The Eastern Question, The Kingdom, written in 1898, wow. available on Amazon now. So, you know what, Bob, I have heard that the Antichrist is the Assyrian, but this makes a lot of sense now that he, he has some kind of, uh, uh, you know, he is a Jew, but yeah. he does not worship the God of his fathers, and no. that he's now turning towards uh, the God Allah. And doesn't this make sense now with the, yes. the Temple Mount and that this would be a temple for all people and how yes. they're working together with, with some of the Muslims? This is really, really interesting, Bob. What, what do you know about uh, the, the actions of the Antichrist? You had mentioned that in one of your promos, I believe. <laughs> yeah, the, the Bible said he yeah. will actually come, and he, he conquers with a a small force. There's not a lot of people with him, mm -hmm. so he, he, he actually conquers Jerusalem, takes them by stealth, if you will. Wow. But then he, he takes over Jerusalem, especially in the Temple Mount, for, for three and a half years now. That is, to me, that's interesting because we know that there is a final seven years due to come. Mm -hmm. And what gets me, Cindy, is we, we see these prophecy movies where it says, where the Antichrist comes and says, this is our peace agreement for the next seven years. And people are looking for a seven-year peace covenant. Yes, they are, yeah. Three and a half of those years is when Antichrist really takes a hold of things. But 
these seven years come from the prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks. 70 weeks yes. of years were predicted. The first 69 weeks began when the order was given to go and rebuild Jerusalem. It ended when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey and was then crucified. Now, you can work this out, but those 69 weeks of years, Cindy, are not our years. They are years of 360 days per year. That is how the ancients That's worked right. out their years. Yeah. They are lunar years, not our solar years. So when I see a movie where everyone's looking for a seven-year peace agreement, they are wrong. Yes. Because wow. it's seven lunar years, not our years. It, and it is God who says how long it lasts, not the Antichrist. Mm. God says these are 70 years that are appointed. These are seven years that are appointed. And they are seven years at 360 days per year, not our way of judging wow. a year, 365.24 years, uh, days a year. So I think, I think our prophecy teachers are slightly out because seven years at 360 days per year is a month less. Yes. Yeah. Than, than our years, so mm -hmm. it's something interesting to look at. It is something interesting. Yeah, yep. So, Bob, what about um, so so we see that uh, his actions. He's he's. Why don't we continue on that? He's uh, 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 well. Obviously, he honors the God of forces. So this is going to a man that demands his own way, basically. Yes. But yet, I've heard that the first three and a half years is going to be, if, well, of course, if you're going by the seven year, but the, but the beginning years of the Antichrist is that it's going to be prosperous and flourish, and there's going to be peace, and people are going to think that this man is amazing, that he came in to rescue, you know, maybe our economical situation. Yes. So it's, what are your thoughts on that? I think he's, he's, going, he's going to be such a... A charismatic figure. Yes. But if you say this guy is the Antichrist, people are going to look at you and say, you are nuts. Yeah. You're crazy. Mm. This is this man has saved the planet. This man has, has, all right, he's moved in on Jerusalem, but he's brought peace to the region. Mm. He's doing a wonderful job. And what about his religious sidekick? The Bible said he's going to have a sidekick. The Bible calls the false prophet who calls down fire from heaven. Who is this Antichrist? Who is this false prophet? Let's see. We're going on a break. Stay tuned for the final conclusion. We'll be right back. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back. So please stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for Love for the Truth Radio Philadelphia. Look us up on lovefortheTruthRadio.com. We air programs via stream every day. You can find program archives uh, with contributors John Haller, Chris Quintana, Carl Tycrib, Patrick Wood, guests like Bill Koenig, Ray Youngin, Johanna Michelson, Bill Salas, and Jan Markell, and many more veterans of the faith with the voice of truth. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Rapture Ready Radio on Monday evenings on Blog Talk Radio. Radio with Jackie Alnor, along with numerous web radio programs who air us on their stations worldwide. Welcome back. We are in our final segment. And uh, Bob, you have been amazing. Thank you so much for your research and for your amazing information as to what we are to look for right now. Now, I have one last question, and that is, is the Antichrist alive right now? <laughs> That's a $64,000 question, Yes, isn't it, it is. Uh -huh. Was after all we've looked at, Cindy, yes. um, with the evidences for being in the last generation, if we are indeed in the end times and we are in the last generation, as I believe, then yes, yes. I believe he must be around now. But who he is, I don't know. Um, every American president has been the Antichrist. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to put a label on anyone. I'm not Mr. Trump, Jared Kushner. I'm not going to say anybody. I believe. This man will arise. I believe he's waiting in the wings, whoever he is. Mm -hmm. And if we're in the last generation, you're going to see him. Yeah. And I think if we say he is the Assyrian, okay, then we can leave out America at this point. 
So yes. <laughs> anyway, Bob, how can someone get in touch with you uh, or, or, you know, your books just to uh, whether they want to purchase some of your books or whether they want to have even a question to ask you? How do we get in touch with you? Well, you, you could email me, first mm -hmm. of all, if you want to ask me something. Um, uh, it's Bob Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, -L, all in lowercase, Bob Mitchell, 777, that's the number seven, Bob Mitchell, 777, at yahoo.com. So that's pretty simple, all lowercase, Bob Mitchell, 777, mm -hmm. at yahoo.com. And the books, yes, they are available on Amazon. Um and, and I believe they are also available in, from Barnes & Noble in some places. So so that's good. And it's, mm. it's, it's a thrill to be able to do this kind of work, Cindy. Yes, it is. And, Bob, I know that you do go out to speak in conferences. Are you still doing that? Are you available? Now, I know you're in England, so and I did hear that you have been in America uh, yep. you know, doing conferences. Are you still open for doing that? I'm still open for doing that. Just write to mm -hmm. me or via the email. And uh, as a title, just put um, invitation in capital letters and I'll spot that in the emails. And thank you very much. I look forward to speaking at your conference or at your church. We'd have a great time. You, I always use PowerPoint so that you can see what I'm speaking about. Um, it's always good to see what you're talking about, what Amen. the preacher is talking about. As a famous speaker once said, um, as a famous boxer once said, one in the eye is better than two in the ear. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one in your eye looking at my PowerPoint is just as good as hearing me twice in your ear because the eye gate is much more receptive than the ear gate. Right, there you go. Bob, it's been a pleasure to have you on Love for the Truth Radio again. We're looking forward to having you in the future. God bless you and your family, and God bless you listeners. May you have ears to hear what Bob has said today. See you next week. <laughs>